Good morning. My name is Kent Schlecht. Yes, uh, Zach did get that correct. And <clears throat> high school and junior hires, you guys can leave. You don't have to leave, but Zach really wants you to go. So he told me I had to say that. Um, okay, so anyways, um, I got to do my own slides here. This is like multitasking. This is awesome. Okay, so uh, anyways, my name is Kent. I'm a church planner here in Bakersfield and pastor of the Grove Church. Uh, we are a newer church plant that's come to Bakersfield. Uh, we're just getting started, and what better time than the middle of a pandemic? So God's timing, not ours, right? Uh, we trust him for the future. Uh, but I'm excited to be an honor to bring God's word this morning here at Dove Creek. I'm very grateful for your pastor, Jeff. Uh, he's a great man, a uh, good mentor. Uh, he can, I consult him on almost everything I do, and uh, he's a great partner in ministry. Uh, I'm thankful that he's allowing me to come and share with you this morning. 
So just a little bit about myself. I'm married to my beautiful wife of 11 years, Danielle. And uh, she's right now uh, at home with our uh, three beautiful girls. Uh, they're doing a house church group uh, that I've got another leader leading right now. Um, interesting time, but I've got three beautiful daughters, uh, Adeline, Eden, and Annabelle. Uh, they will come back up in the middle of the sermon. Don't worry. There's lots of examples about them. Uh, we are just incredibly grateful for this church's partnership, uh, in this ministry to our little church. And we're proud to link arms as part of the EV free denomination, as we see this mission of the EV free accomplished to multiply transformational churches among all people, even the people of Bakersfield. We're excited to grow this tribe here. Today, I'd like to jump up and in, jump into the middle of Genesis uh, in chapter two. So if you have your Bibles, grab those. As uh, Grove Church, we've just begun this series in Genesis. We're calling it In the Beginning. Hence, you can see this is not your series title. This is ours, but anyways, we'll use it. See, our hope is to trace out our story of the gospel from the beginning in Genesis and see how it ultimately intersects with our stories today. <clears throat> Because our story is the gospel story. We need this story. We need to be reminded of the gospel every day as we live our story out. We will be opening up to Genesis chapter 2. So grab your phone, your Bible, and follow along. So far in chapter 1, we've seen God has been set up as creating and bringing order and function to the earth from chaos. As we continue in the story of the book of Genesis, we'll see how humanity ultimately rebels against God's divine authority and God's subsequent unfolding plan to restore humanity and creation itself to its original purposes by grace through faith. Yes, by grace through faith in the book of Genesis. I love history and that's why I love the book of Genesis. It's a wonderful book. But I love history in general. I love how there just seems to be these great turning points in history where these leaders, great leaders, rise up to the occasion. Uh, they're typically confounded by a problem, and, and the problems typically are asking the question of how many human lives will have to be sacrificed in order to win this upcoming conflict. You know, this question weighs often heavily on these leaders, these men and women in these times of trial. Because no one wants to see even one loss of life on their side. They are being confounded and confronted with the question of what is a human life worth? Or said even differently, what gives human life worth? And today I want to actually examine what gives your life worth today. We will see here in Genesis chapter 2 how God answers that question that he is wonderfully and purposely on, purposely made you in his image. God has wondrously and purposely made you in his image. And this brings you value and worth as we'll see from Genesis chapter two. Today, we'll see three implications of this that we'll be able to apply into our lives and live out our story. Check out Genesis chapter two, verse four. We're gonna jump right into it. <clears throat> this is what these verses say. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Now, this passage begins with this phrase, uh, these are the generations of. Now, this is very common in the book of Genesis. In fact, it marks the ending of one story and the beginning of another. And these narratives actually trace out all through the book as you, it gives the meta structure of what's happening. So if you ever get confused in Genesis, look for these markers. You'll know when something ends and when something begins in each story that goes. Now, chapter two is zooming in on this specific moment when man and woman were created, intimately created. Now, some object to the Genesis 2 narrative and say, oh, this couldn't possibly be how it went down based off of what Genesis 1 just revealed in the sixth day. They're not, com they're not comparable. However, I think these, both these stories are actually comparable. In fact, they're just giving different perspectives of the same event. And we see much even in our own storytelling today 
and movies. I think the best way to see Genesis chapter 2 is detailing out how God specifically made humanity, while chapter 1 is a broader, bigger picture of how God purposed from the beginning to create all things. Genesis 2 is much more like extended scenes at the end than Genesis 1 is the whole story played out in front of us. In fact, this cinematography is happening in verses 5 and 6 as the author is doing his best job to envision a landscape shot of creation moving to the specific creation narrative in verse 7. Check out verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Now, God has been described as speaking creation into ver its very existence. This is also how it describes him actually bringing about the creatures in chapter 1. Now we see how God actually created all of these living creatures from the forming them from the ground. However, as we're going to see, there's a huge difference between these two creatures, the animals and humanity. Because with humanity, he is going to personally breathe life into their bodies. So here's our first implication of how God has wondrously and purposely made you in his image. You are intentionally made with dignity and worth. You are intentionally made with dignity and worth from your creator. See, God sets humanity not just above, as we'll see later in this story, but he sets, it, sets humanity apart from the rest of creation. Nothing else in creation is given as much dignity and worth as humanity. And we see here all human life is precious because it's made in God's image. This act of God intimately creating man is so powerful, so substantive that we see it referenced and alluded to throughout the rest of the Bible. None so clearly as Psalms 139 verses 13 through 14. Go ahead and check these verses out on the screen above. It says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Why? Because you were created by God. Your soul knows it. Now, you may have heard these verses to rally for uh, protecting the unborn life. And we do not typically endorse candidates or measures on the ballot. That's not our game. That's not our realm. However, when the Bible speaks authoritatively and clearly, we have to speak likewise in good conscience to not just preach it to the onlooking world, but preach it to our own hearts and minds. Because the Bible's teaching about the image of God in each person, we believe all are important to God. No matter whether you're unborn or elderly, whether you have the same skin color as me or do not, no matter your national origin, immigration status, or ethnicity, you are, as God has called us, you are in, made in God's image, and we are called to help all people find their hope and redemption in Jesus alone. For we are all created in God's image. We support life, and we will defend the dignity of life wherever we find human life. We have dignity and worth because we are made in His image. He gives us value. Something no one can take away from another human being. This is from our creator. Here's the thing. We don't treat people like animals because we are not animals. We are made in his image, in the creator's image, with dignity and worth. You know, it's interesting. Without this core belief, we would not have the amazing agreement worldwide, internationally, with regards to human rights. Now, they may not give credit to where credit is due, but it's due in part because God created us in his image. This is one of the greatest contributions 
the Bible has made to our society at large. We must recognize that. But let's turn our attention back to this passage in verse 8. After God has done creating man, he turns to make a wonderful home for him. Look at verse 8. He says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east where there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and and the, the tree of the knowledge of good. And evil. Now here, uh, chapter three is being set up. The, the chapter three where there'll, there'll be the fall of humanity is being set up right here with the mention of these two trees. Now verses 10 through 14 uh, continue in the narrative and it details out the location of Eden and actually starts talking about rivers. And some of these rivers we, we know, right? Some of these rivers we're like, I've never heard of the Pashan, you know? And so it's starting to identify and maybe the ancient people had a better idea of where these exactly were, but, but it details out the location as as it continues in this story. In verse 15, he turns back to the man and to his home in Eden and to the earth. And he says this, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So here we come to the second implication of being wonderfully and purposely made in his image. We are to treat God's creation as an owner, not a renter. We are to treat God's creation as an owner, not a renter. What do I mean by that? Well, you may think because renters don't care about what they are renting, uh, but that's not always true. All, not all renters tear up homes and apartments and leave them thrashed. Now, it does happen from time to time. Now, my wife and I rented out our house to some folks, and we got it back pretty, pretty, pretty well. Uh, and, but we also moved out to Arizona to do uh, a residency on how to start a church uh, about a year ago. And well, like two years ago now, but anyways, it came back like a year ago and it was with the EV free. And while we were in Arizona, we rented a house. So I'm very familiar about being a renter, right? And an owner. Now, while we were there, our default response to potential problems we saw around the house was not to worry about it, ultimately, because we were there temporarily. You know, as long as the building didn't actually fall down on us, like, which may have been an issue on something I saw, but, you know, and I reported that to the owners because I was like, I don't want this building to fall down on me. Um, But nothing else that, unless it affected us currently, we saw these potential problems as not ours to deal with. See, the main mindset of a renter is not necessarily that they don't care, but they view where they are as temporary or at least one that they don't feel empowered to do anything about what they're seeing. It doesn't mean we didn't actually care about the house. We liked the house. It was great. It was a wonderful little home. We have many memories from there. We just couldn't do anything. We weren't empowered to do any of the fixes or uh, the things that we wanted to be done. But owners have to care. See, owners don't get the the luxury of not caring or caring. See, if they don't do the repairs, the house goes into disrepair and it will lose value. See, there are actual real life consequences to owners when they don't care for their home. If you don't fix it, no one else is responsible for fixing your house for you. In fact, especially when it comes to selling your house, you'll just lose the value right there or you'll have someone asking you to do repairs, which is never fun. See here, God has placed man in the garden on earth. And what has he placed him there to do? Look at the text. It says, work it and keep it. See, there's something that we intrinsically just don't agree with from our society. We believe we were not meant to work. We believe we were meant for the weekend. We're meant to get out of town, to relax. We get to retirement. But actually from the beginning, God created us intentionally and wonderfully for work, believe it or not. He put man in the garden to work it and keep it. Now, I I love how the original actually uses these two words because now they don't rhyme in English, but bear with me. In the original, these words actually rhyme with two other words that are very similar. The words are worship and obey. And actually many people believe that that could have been that it was worship and obey, but either one works, but they actually, there's, there's a unique thing that 
as we understand it as work and keep, and with the illusion that it was worship and obey, we see God longs for his image bearers to worship him through their work. That you were meant to work. You can bring glory and honor to God by the way you work. Work is not evil. Work is not sinful. And this is for sure means the the job you go into day in and day out. But there's a broader idea here as well. It's a concept that includes the calling and responsibility we have as owners of God's home. That's what Adam was given care of. Just look back at chapter one, verse 28. It explains what he is calling his image bearers to do as owners. Check out the verse, verse 28. And God blessed them. And said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens. And over every living thing that moves on the earth. See, God longs for his image bearers to fill the earth. God's presence in the earth through his image bearers. That's what he's meant by multiply and fill the earth. As humanity has children, they're going to take possession of God's wonderful world for them. See, I love this implication to these verses. Uh, God loves children and babies, right? Like there's no no denying it. In fact, we actually see that in Jesus' life as God comes into flesh, lives among us. We actually see the scene where Jesus' disciples are holding back some kids from coming to Jesus because kids are nuisances, right? And the kids are inconveniences. But what does Jesus tell them? Let the children come to me. The creator of the universe, God in flesh, he's got work to do, takes time for children. And from the beginning, God has a heart for babies and children. He commanded the children to come. Children are not inconveniences, though they can be a handful. They can be a handful. I've got three, five and under, so I know plenty. They can be a handful. But if you see children as purely inconveniences, as hindrances to your true goals and aspirations, then I'm going to challenge you to ask God to change your heart. I'm going to challenge you to take God's perspective that he loves the next generation. He loves his image bearers that are being raised up. What a privilege it is to walk alongside parents, if you're not one, and to actually parent but does that mean you have to have kids right now? So text saying like, you know, have kids and have as many as you can. Not necessarily, no. No, you don't, you're not, God's not commanding that you absolutely must have children. There are times and seasons for all of these, as Ecclesiastes tells us. But don't pretend to play God in having children. Let's not pretend to play God and be God. God is the giver of life. If he gives life, this is an opportunity to have an open hand towards God and accept his gracious blessing. But besides that, what do I mean by have an open hand to God? What does that even mean? Well, it's it's something that I use in my life. It's something that a mentor has passed on to me to encourage me as, as I sit before God, as I am challenged by something maybe God is trying to give me or even take from me, to hold my hand open in prayer to God. And this is a stance I probably like, like use all the time, whether I actually extend my hand or it's just something I know within my own heart as I pray to God. But it's the idea that you're acknowledging that you are not ultimately in control of the outcome of this prayer. You are not ultimately in the outcome, in control of the outcome of this decision. If God wants to take something from my life, from your life, he's going to take it. There's no stopping God. There's ultimately two ways we can come to this conundrum. And we can come to it either with either of these. And I've had both these responses. And I can tell you the second one's way better. Way better. The first is this, you can hold tightly to that which is God is trying to take from your hand and you can hold on to it and grow bitter and angry and and worn out because all that you'll be left with, you won't be left with a thing that's in your hand. You'll be left out with a worn out, tired hand and the thing that you so long put so much value and, and put so much worth into. You'll just be left worn out. The second option is that you can extend that open hand to God. 
giving God this open hand and asking for his courage and his peace to as he decides whether to take it or not. This is the life of faith. This is the life that is trusting in God alone. This is a life, this is a way to live that brings glory to God. And, and this goes way beyond just making life affirming choices. It covers a multitude of areas. It, it covers whenever Christians find themselves or non-Christians, doesn't matter when, when God wants to take something, this conundrum of do I give it to God or do I hold on to it? Will you submit to God's way? So today, is there an area in your life that you are struggling with God over? How are you going about it? Are you willing to have an open hand to him? Are you willing to trust God for the outcome? Like I said, I, I do this uh, regularly in my life. Uh, so at the Grove, we have you know, in the middle of the pandemic, we've decided we're going to go into this. We're going to go all in and um, we're just going to start, start this church. And, um, it's totally an act of like complete faith. Like when you think like faith is blind, like yeah, completely in this situation, completely, but we are going in it and we've actually started these house church groups and we're excited and we're, we're hoping and we're praying that God would expand these and multiply these. And as we do that, though, uh, we were beginning to actually spread out and we're realizing we want to come back together and, and still like, like this. We want to gather in a large group. That's our vision still. But uh, ultimately, there's not a lot of space. We don't have a beautiful facility like you guys. It's a beautiful facility. Thank God for it. But uh, so we don't have a place. We can't find a place. So we decided to start doing these outdoor services. So this last month, we had done one prior to doing this. We did it in September in someone's backyard, uh, which not ideal. So we decided to do it at one of the parks. Well, the city graciously uh, has provided uh, where you can apply for a special permit, which is cool. I didn't know that until I tried. Now, I started a while back, and I was doing all the things that I could do. Now, I just don't understand insurance. That's, that's fair. Like, I don't work in insurance. And they're using language I didn't know about. And so they were telling me I needed certain things, and I was working with insurance. I was working with them. But anyways, it came down to the Friday before for Sunday, and I still did not have permission to meet in the park. I don't know what I would have done. I'll say that. I don't know. But uh, I was sitting in this situation going, I don't know what to do. But I had these two options. I could either hold on to this, and the city was saying, you need this endorsement from your insurance, whatever. The insurance was trying to get it to me. They're saying, we're not going to have it till Monday. So where does that leave me? The city's like, you need it. The insurance says, I can't give it to you. So now I'm caught between these two groups. I'm going, I'm really upset, right? So I have the decision I can hold on to this thing and just grow angry and bitter over it, completely ticked off over the whole process. Like I've tried so hard. These people are holding me up, right? Or I can hand it over to God by opening my hand to him and, and, and praying that he would make a way that he would, he would take this from us or he would give it to us. I can tell you, the outcome was me holding my hand open and God won a great victory. And I would say almost miraculous because the city said they weren't going to permit us. They weren't going to allow us in the park. And I didn't get them the endorsement by Friday. In fact, it didn't come till later in the week, in front of the fire week. But they allowed us to meet. It wasn't because I was cunning or smart or uh, very, a good hustler, whatever it is. I did not get any of the credit. I can say today that God answered my prayer. He won the victory. I give him the glory. I give him the praise. But that's the power of having an open hand to God. But think about the other op op option. I could have held on to it. I could have gotten really bitter. Or shoot, at best, I could have said, you know, I got approved. I'm like, check me out, right? I fought the man. And I got the permit, right? Like, I, look how great I am. Neither were preferred. Neither are preferred. Better to have an open hand to God for him to win the battle, for him to get the glory. I want us to jump back in to see our roles as owners as we continue to look at verse 28 and how humanity is to subdue and have dominion over creation. God longs to see us as stewards of this creation. He gives it to us to subdue and have dominion over. Now, 
I'm under no delusion that we all here agree on how to steward this wonderful home we call Earth, right? We, we probably don't all land on the same page. We may, in fact, have very different ideas on how to handle the resources of Earth. However, when we disagree as fellow believers, we should always do it in grace, in grace with one another, seeking unity above anything else. I want to challenge this, though, as owners... We cannot take a temporary view, neither wherever we land, we cannot take this temporary view of our earth as if it's disposable or if it's infinite. We need the pride of ownership, but we need to have it under God. You know, it's uh, something me and my wife, we love this old show called, it's not terribly old, so I'm gonna date myself or I'm gonna sound like you know, no one else knows what the show is, but that's okay, I'm gonna risk it. We love this show called 30 Rock. It's a, it's a comedy and it's, we just find its humor very, very funny at times. Now, uh, in one of the episodes, they are kind of going through and highlighting this green week, green week, like saving the earth, green, right? Green initiatives everywhere. And at the end of the show, they're filming this one segment with this su fake superhero called Greenzo. And he's like completely demented and he's going crazy. And they have this whole set um, production set up and there's this production light that gets tipped over, knocks into this enormous floating earth with a big smiley face on it. And the smiley face earth blows up in flames and starts like catching on fire and everyone's running to extinguish the flames. And as the, as the, as the, as the scene turns to the credits, you hear Tina Fey, who's one of the, the actresses on the show, say, oh no, this earth is ruined, we need another one. And I just, it cracks me up every time I hear that story, every time I watch that show, uh, especially this scene. I think it captures what many people feel is true, but is not. They either believe that this earth is all we have, and if we ruin it, we won't get another. Or they believe that God's going to one day make a whole new heaven and earth, so why does this one matter? Both of these are renter mindsets, not owners. I think both miss what God is calling his image bearers to be focused on with regards to stewardship of creation. Two truths are critical if we're going to understand our role in stewarding God's wonderful provision of a home in this earth. The first is this, this world is not eternal. This world is not eternal. It will not be here forever. We cannot and should not put our hope or trust into the physical world around us. This physical world is not eternal, but God is. If the physical world is eternal, then that would be God. But God is the creator of it. He is the sustainer of it. This earth, this world was meant to point us toward the creator to worship him. Just go outside. Take a hike in the wilderness people who don't even know who Jesus or even God is, they still have this concept of there's something out there. There's something that made this. Just look around. And the scriptures affirm this, is that the creation is the, the skies are the, the, are the handiwork of God. We see this and we know that there's something greater. It is meant for us to worship him, but oftentimes we end up worshiping the creation because of how beautiful it is and how wonderful it is. Creation is not eternal, God is. We need that as the foundation as we discuss on, from any perspective. We need to remember that, this is not eternal. Number two, just because God is going to make a whole new one does not mean that we have to be dismissive with the one we've got. Don't be dismissive with the earth. We cannot mistreat the earth and disregard its, its future for future image bearers because he's going to bring about a whole new one. This doesn't mean that I'm agreeing with or even disagreeing with climate change or global warming or any other issue or topic that can be considered in this area. But my point is, is as we come to these, we need to have these as our foundation. This is what scripture would call us to. Because anything else risks us going and becoming idolatrous or just full of ignorance. Creation was made for man to build a home and a future with. 
In fact, we see in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, right, we see that God created a garden for man as a home. But did you know at the end in Revelation, it's a city. God created this world for, for progress, for, for cultures, for these things. And in fact, God works this into his plan of redemption. Then the end, it's a city of God coming down from heaven. It's a beautiful thing. Creation was made for man to build a home, to subdue and have dominion over. God's perfect world isn't an agricultural world, as we see later in Revelation. But this world was not meant to be abused because we're going to get a new one either. See, it is God who's in charge. He gets to make the rules. He, not us, just look at verse 16 and 17 as we continue. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. See, it's God who sets the rules. He sets boundaries for his children. Now, my three little girls, they want to stay up all night and they want to eat all the candy and all the sweets in the house, right? We just made some ice cream the other day. And they wanted to eat. Oh, let's keep eating. Let's keep eating, right? But they don't get to make the rules. I do. I'm the father. God is father. He makes the rules. We continue to see humanity's ownership as God commissions Adam to name the animals in verse 19. He continues to say, hey, subdue and have dominion. So Adam starts naming. That shows his authority to act on God's behalf as his agent. But before he does that, verse 18 has an interesting introduction. Just check it out. This is God speaking. And, and if we remember anything from chapter one, when God speaks, it's very important. Things happen. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. He created, he created everything. And every time he creates, right, in Genesis 1, it's good. But now he's created man, and what does he say? He's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. See, man alone is not a perfect reflection of God's image. He needs another. It's fascinating because in chapter one, we actually read in his image, God created them. Male and female, he created them. As we move forward to chapter two, we see that God actually created man and then woman. But it's not until woman comes that the complete image of God is here. Here's our third implication today. God created me for more than myself. You've been wonderfully and purposely made in his image, but not for yourself. You created for more than yourself. You may be wondering in your minds, it seems kind of a weird place to take these verses since they're going to be fully focused on marriage in these next verses. And we for sure we'll get to that because that is the main point in the, the first marriage or the, the, the bringing together of the husband and wife. But there's often something we overlook in this text and I, and I want to zoom in on because I, I think it speaks to everyone's circumstance. It's this truth. You are not self-sufficient. You were not made for yourself alone. You can't do it all. You weren't created to do it all. I don't care if you're male or female. You were made for more than yourself. You were made, you were created to not to be alone, to have community, to have a tribe, to have people around you. That doesn't mean that you were 100% created to get married because some of you aren't married and some of you will never get married and that's fine. And, and because some of you guys may never even have kids and that's good too because you're, you're chasing after God, you're pursuing him, you're, you're making him your all in all. See, here we don't have the situation that we have to help these single people who are infected with the singleness as if it's a disease. See, oftentimes in the church, we can make people feel lesser because they're single, but that, that's, not, that's not what this text is getting at. So let's separate that. But we don't want to allow this, this real and hard sense of loneliness to come in and think that the only solution is marriage. God has a bigger plan, bigger vision for community than just marriage, but it's at least marriage. See, there's a real 
sense that we exist for ourselves. There's something deep in our hearts that call out for that. And here in Genesis, we hear the resounding answer to that. No, you were created for more than just yourself, for what you can accomplish. In fact, God does not even declare creation very good until there's two of his image bearers. God did not need us. We needed him. And this is ultimately pointing to our need for God in community. But he's also provided us one another. Such an important part of creation. You were made in his image wondrously and purposely for more than yourself. You know, it's been said a thousand different ways. But man, and it still rings true, man is not an island. Have you ever watched the movie Castaway? I like Castaway. It's it's kind of depressing a little bit. So again, I'm dating myself. It's okay. Uh, But you have Tom Hanks who's stranded on this island all by himself. And and what happens? He starts losing his mind, right? From loneliness. And, And so it's not the director or the writers of Castaway's intention, but I think they accidentally point to the fact that that there's something internally built within us that is broken when we're left alone in true isolation. That's what makes isolations, right? Uh, and, and being isolated so uh, torturous because you're left to yourself and we were never meant to be that way. We were always meant to be with others. So what does Tom do when he's losing his mind? I don't remember the character's name is. I just know him as Castaway. Uh, but what does he lose his mind? He creates Wilson, right? And Wilson is this made up character, made up, made up thing. It's a, it's a volleyball from Wilson, the, the, the brand. And Tom talks to him and, and in fact, he loses Wilson, right? And how many of you guys cried when Wilson floated away? You know, yeah, it's like you started believing that he's really there because in Tom, he needed that community. He needed someone. I think this, this gives a picture of what we need in this life. But we were created for more than just ourselves. We we're for sure created for God in relationship to God. There's a connection that's alluded to back in Genesis 1. That this really good connection, this very good. But we're also created for community. We're created for more than just our own ambition. I want to turn our attention back to marriage as we look into the main point of this text again. Because we need to move back towards what the text is teaching. See, we see that in marriage, God brings two people together for life. You have this woman who was God's choice for this man. Uh, She's going to need that assurance for the rest of her days. I can tell you that for sure. My wife needs that. You were meant for him. God, especially what happens in chapter three, God intentionally has created woman as a partner, as a co-heir. And what happens in Genesis three it shows the division and, and the, the ugliness of the unfolding result of our sin. That's a devastating result for the rest of our story until Jesus. Because ultimately, throughout the millennium, men had begun to subjugate women under their control because of the curses found in Genesis 3. If you look at the curse of the woman, it says that your, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. This isn't God saying, this is how I designed it. This is what was very good about marriage. No, this is the resulting curse that that woman would have a desire to subjugate her husband and a resulting effect was the husband would subjugate the wife. This resulting conflict and struggle for the rest of time. But I love how when Jesus comes on the scene, he raises women back up to their co-heir position as daughters to the king. Marriage is not meant for just you. And that's important because in this culture we live in, we often look to, for marriage to fulfill things it was never created for, never created to fulfill or satisfy. We often view our marital happiness as the goal, that, that marriage, marriage should bring us joy and happiness. And I'm not gonna say like, it's never happy, but I recently have done some weddings and, and I try to always convey that your happiness isn't the goal of marriage. 
Because often these couples, when they're so sweet, right? They're standing before you and they're just so happy. And the guys always, like, not always, but the guys, a lot of my guys cry. You know, they're just in tears. And I love it. It's a sweet moment. But this isn't the best picture of what a marriage is going to be. Hey, ultimately, this is just the beginning. This is, this is a sweet thing to remember. But the goal of marriage is not happiness. And often if you, ch- if you chase the dream and chase the illusion of marital happiness and marital joy, it will end up being an idol that will imprison your joy and often destroy the very bond you so desperately desire to keep. See, marriage has a bigger and greater impact than just on your happiness. It's meant to make an impact on future generations as they see see this beautiful picture of, of redemption and love and forgiveness, conflict with forgiveness. It's not that lack of fighting occurs, but the fighting results in forgiveness and restoration. It's meant to make an impact as future generations see this marriage and they see it as honoring to God. It's funny, actually, that that even marriage in this text was meant to have an effect on the families of origin, right? Just look how Genesis ends in this passage, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. See, here God is showing us the first family. He's bringing these together as one flesh, it was the purpose that these, this marriage was to have an effect on the family of origin. God wanted them to have an impact even as they leave and cleave. Here they are pictured as God's perfect people living in God's perfect place under God's perfect rule. It's no better, more perfect picture than this. This is what's meant in verse 25 as he sums it all up. This is the essence, is this perfection that has occurred. And what does he say? The text says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. You know, it's this concept of naked and not ashamed that demonstrates the innocence and the connection back to God that these two had. They didn't know better that they were naked They didn't know any shame. And this is how God intended them. This is how God intended all of us with no shame connected to our heavenly father. We are such an important part of God's story because we were wondrously and purposely made in his image. See, this is where the gospel starts. That's why it's so important that we go back to Genesis, that we understand our origin, that we understand what God made us to feel, to know, to experience, to be. We were made in his image to be connected in relationship with him. I've got to ask though, do you feel that connection? Do you feel close to God? Well, the resulting would answer would be no, we, we are not close to God. Because as we go forward, you see Genesis 3, where sin enters, division, death comes in. We are separated from God. And there's no way for us to make it right with God. In fact, God shows us throughout this narrative, his gracious hand to to provide for us. Even in in Genesis chapter three, God, once they are naked and ashamed, and they they know that they're not innocent anymore, God sacrifices and provides a way for them to be clothed on a beautiful image of God's grace and provision through sacrifice. But today, do you feel connected? Do you feel close to God? If you're a believer today, I hope that you can see this connection you have in Jesus, that you take hold of him every day, trusting in the gospel more each day. It's something that we need to trust in as we wake up and I can guarantee you there's many days I do not trust in the gospel and it goes really poorly for me, really poorly. But when I trust in Jesus, when I look to him for satisfaction, when I look to him as my all in all, life gets easier. Life is sweeter. Life is ultimately easier because I line up with my created purpose. 
See, the connection that we see alluded to as very good in Genesis 1 can be ours if we look in faith toward Jesus who took our place on the cross. God's provision, God's blood sacrifice for our sin to make us right with him. See, Jesus lived the life we could not live. And oftentimes, if I'm being honest, I try to live the perfect life. Even when I accept Jesus, I say, well, God, well, you know, I'm doing better. It's not what God expects from us. God expects for us to live by faith as we trust in his grace over our lives. Jesus lived the perfect life. I could never live. God's not calling me to live a perfect life. He's calling me a life dependent on Jesus, a life that is in reflection of what Jesus has done for me. Jesus died the death we deserve. He died the death we deserved. Jesus took our, our penalty, our cost. He suffered and bled. And for those who look in faith to Jesus, God accepts Jesus' sacrifice for forgiveness of our sins. Wherever we have failed, Jesus has not. Wherever we've lacked, Jesus has been sufficient and more than sufficient. We can look to him to be our all in all. I want to encourage you today, if you've never trusted in Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with God, if, if, if I asked, what kind of connection do you have to God? And you say, it's not there. Because of what resulting in Genesis 3 has happened, that we are all fallen and fall short of God's glory, that we don't have that connection any longer. I want to encourage you to look to Jesus alone for faith. Look to Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sin. We would love to help you start experiencing this new life that Jesus has promised, that Jesus has provided through his sacrifice, through his death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. This can be yours today as you trust in him alone for the forgiveness of your sin. I'm gonna invite the band up and as they, as they come and play, I wanna encourage you to join me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And maybe it's right here and now that you're a believer and you've, you've trusted in the gospel before, but you're finding yourself far from God. You, you don't feel the connection. I encourage you in faith to trust in Jesus once more, to look to him as your sacrifice, to look to him as the one who can make you right before God. Stop trying to appease God where Jesus has already done it on your behalf. Trust him again. There may be someone in this room who's never trusted in Jesus. You know, we want to invite you. We want to help you make that decision. Uh, and right where you are now in the, in the quietness, you don't have to say it out loud, but we'd love to help you afterwards do that as well. Right where you are, just to, to declare that you are a sinner, that you are lost, that you are separated from God, that you are in need of Jesus, to be your substitute, to take your place that God would look to him and he would give you, God would give you the forgiveness of your sin. Just tell him right now that you want to trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin. God, I pray as you've met us this morning, as we've opened your word, that you would continue to act and speak into our lives. God, that you've made us in your image. We are meant to be airmen bearers. And now you've given us this message of hope. You've given us this message of restoration that we get to bear to the rest of the world. As you've sent us out to be a witness, we pray that you would give us boldness to speak this message. God, and even more boldness to trust and obey it, that we'd walk in it each day, that we'd remember the gospel, that we would not forget it, that you would comfort our hearts with your provision and your sacrifice. May we be your image bearers now as we go out from this room. And God, I pray for those who are making decisions for trusting you for the first time, that you would give us courage and boldness to speak it out. You would give us courage and boldness to come forward and tell others of our decision. And we pray that you would do this even today. I pray that you would go before us in Jesus' name. Amen.
There's a table that you prepare for me in the presence of my enemies. It's your body and your blood you shed for me. And this is how I fight my battles. There's a table. It's your body and your blood you shed for me and This is how I fight my battles And I believe you've overcome And I will lift my song of praise for all you've done and This is how I fight my battles this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley, I know the joy. But I'm surrounded by you 
this is how Yes, this is how I find my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how